So I, I think when you have that recognition of the complexity, it gives you freedom to ask questions about the Bible, and it gives you freedom to ask questions about our lives today and about our sexual ethics today as well. Okay. Okay. One, two, ready, go. Welcome to the Called to be Bad podcast. My name is Mariah Martin, and I feel called to be bad. It turns out I'm not the only one. Join us as we dig into all things bad, scandalous, deviant, you know, the stuff that makes good church folks squirm in the sanctuary. Why? Well, because sometimes the scandalous is spiritual, deviant is divine, and bad is beautiful. Say yes to the call and let's see what holy trouble we get into today. Hello, Christine. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. Um, so this is Christine Wolgar. Uh, she is an avid reader and musician living in the UK. She loves to delve scripture and write on hope, sexuality, and consent. So hello, all the things. I love it. Uh, she also has experience leading worship and volunteering for a leading domestic violence charity. Um, she blogs at Light in Great Places and Faith in Great Places, which, you know, I will probably say it multiple times, but if you care about the Bible, you need to stop everything. Don't stop listening to the podcast, but after the podcast, go and read her blog. It's amazing. Um, she's also on Twitter at Hope for Gray Places, and she spells, uh, for all of this, she spells gray, G-R-E-Y. Hope yeah. for gray. Um, I didn't think that one through when I, <laughs> yeah. I it. yeah, but it makes sense. I love it. Yeah. And, and so we want to, we're going to have, we're going to dive into Deuteronomy 22. Um, and so we want to start off with a content warning that we will be talking about um, honor based and sexual violence. So take care of yourselves, you know, take it slowly. Um, and yeah, so that, that, that is what we will be talking about today. So Christine, uh, where did your heart for this passage come from? And it's specifically Deuteronomy 22. And is it 12 through 29 or 13? 13, 13 through 29. Yeah. 13 through 29. Okay. Um, so I grew up um, in a family, in a Christian family, and we were very much encouraged to read the Bible, read the Bible kind of cover to cover, which I did. I, I finally did that when I was a teenager. And um and I do love the Bible and I do very much see it as, um, an, as a gift and as inspired by the Holy Spirit and something through which I learn. And, um, and what's, what's interesting about this particular passage is that it has six laws in it about, um, well, <laughs> actually there, there's, a, there's a big question about what it's actually about, but they appear to be about sex, um, especially um, uh, you know, women and, and when, uh, and, and various offenses that are capital offenses. And um, the and, and what's interesting is that when I was growing up, I interpreted them uh, kind of as literally as I could for my circumstances. Um, and, and then years and years down the line, I reached a point where suddenly I saw something that made me feel uncomfortable. And I thought, actually, I need to probe into this deeper. So um, so the, the six laws, um, the first two are supposedly about um, a, a bride who was meant to be a virgin, but who is accused of being um, of not being a virgin when she married. And it looks like, you know, oh, well, if she's innocent, then the husband is punished. And, and if she's guilty, then she's stoned to death. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and, and, it, and the, the proof that she's innocent in uh is meant to be like the the bed sheets from the wedding night you know stained with her hymenial blood and um when i when i read that i you know i'd been told oh yes women have a hymen it, it will it will bleed it won't bleed from a tampon but it will from a penis and mm -hmm. um you know and it will from a smear test right <laughs> and and um and you know and i'm thinking well you know the, the 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 right way to do this is to wait until marriage and then on your wedding night you know you have sex your hymen breaks then you bleed and then you you know that that's that's how things should happen so i i took this passage is very much about my biology and um and then when i was at university uh i i turned down smear tests um for uh 
cervical cancer, cervical screening, um, because I didn't want my hymen to be touched. Now, as, as it turns out, um, as I now know, having married and having had sex, I don't think I had a hymen, <laughs> or at least if I do, it certainly didn't bleed. Right. Um, I, Can we, and, I want to, I want to talk more about the hymen right now, because most, I don't think most people know this, and it's super important that your, your, um, hymen kind of bio from a biological standpoint um, is there from infancy so that when you are born you are not infected with any of the bacteria um, as you are uh, being birthed and mm -hmm. so at, as I, I just read from like um, age two on or something your hymen drastically changes um, and some people never have a hymen at all um, and it's it's a very um, flexible Oh, I don't want to use the wrong term. Membrane. membrane. Yeah, yeah, membrane. Um, it, it shifts and moves, it changes. Um, some people have perforated hymens, meaning there's like little holes in their hymens. They're all different shapes and sizes. There is no one hymen. Um, and I'm getting a lot of my information from this book, Virgin, The oh. Untouched History um, by Hannah Blanc. Uh, highly recommend, but yes, this myth about the hymen and that it breaks um, is is not true at all. And and I think that you mentioned at some point, uh, maybe in your blog, that if it does tear and bleed from sex, it's probably not actually the hymen that is bleeding. It is just from general um, tissue tears from lack of lubrication. Uh, yeah. And that's from Come As You Are, um, yeah. by Emily Nagoski, also amazing book. So I just yeah. wanted to pop in here because this is super Absolutely. Do you want to, do you want to say more to that? I mean, I think I, I won't deny for some women, it does work this way. You know? <laughs> and, I, and I've heard the stories, they made me laugh. Um, but, but for many women, they don't. And, and I think the point is that, you know, when I, I, <laughs> It sounds stupid when you say it, but it's like there was a way, there was a sense in which I was reading the Bible as teaching me about biology. Sure. And um, it, that, that, <laughs> that's not a good way to read the Bible, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and I was making decisions about my body that weren't appropriately informed by medical science. So, I don't actually see any conflict between science and religion. I, I you know, the, the if, you know, the Bible says that the, the sun and the moon are two great lights, okay, the moon is not a light, it does not emit in the, the visible spectrum, it reflects light from the sun. For me, th there is no conflict, it's, it's two different ways of trying to articulate something. So, but, uh, so I, I just think it, it is, I was not helped by the fact that I did not have a good sex education. Oh. Um, you know, I didn't know what my clitoris was until I was having sex therapy whilst I was married. I, you know, I yeah. didn't know what it did, didn't know where it was. Yeah. That <laughs> um, is the reality for so many. You are, you are not alone. So, so, you know, that didn't help. But in the, in that context, I was reading the Bible and I was taking, you know, ed sex education from the Bible pages. And, and actually I, that was not helpful for me. And, and that's, I don't think that's, necessary or even an appropriate way to be looking at this text because there is a lot more going on and we'll get into this um as regards to the social context the social assumptions um you know the whole genre the idea of law as a genre mm. um is important as well so there's a lot more in the text than just taking it at face value this is how the hymen's meant to work um and 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 if you if you don't bleed on your wedding night then you deserve the death penalty it's like that is just not true um, just not true. We will come back to it. But um, so that that's the first set of laws. The, the, the first pair is is about kind of virginity and proof of virginity and um, what if you're not a virgin. Um, and then there's this uh, law about not committing adultery, which generally speaking, nobody says very much about, which is fine. And then you get another pair of laws um, about a betrothed virgin. Um, and in ancient Israel, um, betrothal was much more formal than engagement so it was it was like being married and there's a law about um, the betrothed virgin in the city and then the betrothed virgin in the country and it says in the, in the city if a man has sex with her and she, well they both die because she didn't cry out and you're like whoa <laughs> and then and then in the country it's like oh well she could have cried out and nobody would have been there to help her so you know you you, you don't harm her 
um, I was never very troubled by it. And I remember a guy at university quoting these laws to me, um, saying that he was absolutely disgusted with them. And he was just like, yeah, how is that in any way appropriate? You know, if you're raped, it's like, there are so many reasons why you might not scream, um, you know, and, and like, you know, rape in the city shouldn't be a death penalty. Like, like, you know, why on earth did the Bible say that? And, um, and I was so used to people quoting the Bible to me inaccurately. Mm. I was just like, yeah, that's what it says. <laughs> I, I didn't know. But I, I didn't really have any answer. And I, I think I believe that um, if a woman had a freeze response, then any decent judge would know about that, which is probably quite naive. But, um, but, it, but you know, at the end of the day, I, I was in a situation where I, I knew, I knew that for a reason I did not understand, many women when they're assaulted um, and sexually assaulted, uh, they will respond by freezing, they will not cry out. And I knew that. And I knew that was something I did not understand. Sure. Um, so I suppose I viewed this law as like, an, maybe a bit naive, maybe a bit primitive, maybe a bit, well, it's a starting place and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take a more nuanced take now, but I, it, it, it didn't, trouble me so much but I do appreciate that it troubles a lot of other people mm -hmm. um and um yeah so so that was kind of the, the, the that that pair of laws and then there's this last law which is about um if a man seizes interesting word so if he seizes um a virgin who is not betrothed um and has sex with her then they are to marry he has to pay the bride price and they have to marry. And when I grew up, I was taught to believe that, you know, having sex um, forms a soul tie between two people. And I, I do believe that sex is a profoundly spiritual and in intimate act. Um, but, you know, so I kind of kind of don't want to say it's completely untrue, but I'm also quite willing to believe there's a lot of superstition in there as well. So, you know, how, how true is it? But, but because I had been taught that, when I came to this verse in this last law, I thought, wow, okay, so the, the bond created by sex is so strong that it has to be honored through marriage, even in cases of rape. And that's how I interpreted it. And um, and that is not how I interpret it now. So yeah, <laughs> we'll get to it. But but um, but it, it's and 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 it's because I I you know I I had these different experiences with these laws and and for, for whatever reason, um, I still felt safe reading the Bible. I still felt God was good. I still was not troubled by it. I still was happy to read it. Um, and I I, I don't know how that computed in my head. It, it just did. Um, but then a few years later, um, I was reading this passage again, and I noticed that in the first pair of laws, the one about virginity, if the woman is innocent, then the man is punished. He, he gets a triple penalty. He's flogged, he's fined, and he's forbidden from ever divorcing her. Okay, so he, he, he loses a lot of power. He's but if the woman is found guilty, she dies. Mm. And so there's this inequality between the two laws. Right. And, and that was kind of the first time that I really thought, oh, what am I reading here? Mm. You know, what does this say about God? Is God safe? You know, God. um, and I thought, well, I, I had recently read a book about um, the book of Esther by a Jewish scholar called Aaron Collar and it was a brilliant book and I thought well, maybe he's written something about it. In 2011 or 2012 he had written a paper about the slandered bride and and he, he the core part of his paper is basically saying what did she do to deserve death like why why is this second law why if if there are no bloody bed sheets why is she killed because it doesn't make sense. You know, the absence of the blood doesn't prove anything because the hymen is not a reliable proof of virginity. They knew the hymen was not a reliable proof of virginity. You know, supposing she hadn't been a virgin, that doesn't mean to say that she was unfaithful during the betrothal period. You know, the, the, the description about what she's guilty of 
is different. It's not actually saying that she's guilty of adultery. So, so what is it? What is her crime? And, and why is there this imbalance? And what he basically argues in his paper is that on the surface, this looks like it's about sex. You know, she had sex before marriage. That wasn't okay. That gets punished. And he's like, no, that's not really what it's about. What they were trying to get at was um, the relationship between the parents and her as a daughter. And in the parent-child relationship, um, if she if she is found guilty, if, um, what she's really being found guilty of is subverting her parents' authority mm. and, and by extension, undermining the fabric of society. And the, the family honor was very important in the ancient world. And so the, the idea was that it, it, you know, she's not being punished for having sex before marriage. That's not what it is. She's being punished for um, dishonoring her parents in such a way that was so grievous that it, it was considered to warrant the de death penalty. The point here is the second law. So this, this pair of laws that go together, the first one where he accuses her and she's found innocent because they produce the blood sheets, the bloody blood sheets. And the second one where she gets stoned to death. They were written at different times mm -hmm. and they were written by different authors with different priorities. So when you look at what the groom is doing, he's not going to court and bearing false witness. He's not committing perjury. What he's doing is he's just going around slandering her. He's just going around, giving her a bad name, going around saying to people, grumble, grumble, grumble. She wasn't a virgin. She wasn't a virgin. You know, her parents kind of cheated me out of the virgin bride price. You know, how sucky is that? You know, now I'm stuck with her. Like, so very abusive behaviors, absolutely. But he's, he's just committing, I say just, he's committing slander, not perjury, slander. So the first law is not about him accusing his bride, you weren't a virgin, that's not it. What it is, is the parents saying to the groom, how dare you bow, bad mouth our daughter, okay? Um, and, and so the man's crime is that he's, he's trying to get an unfair divorce, he's trying to get back the, the, the bride price that he paid and he is slandering the bride's family and it's for these three things that he gets punished but the the idea that actually it is the parents who instigate this is the parents not the man is the parents um was a bit of a game changer for me and, and when you think about the law in those terms like just that first one it's actually really good for women <laughs> It's really good for women because it, it's like, you know, parents have a mechanism to, to say, you know, men can't just go around bad mouthing these women. So if, if you read these laws from the point of view of this is not about the hymen, this is not about did her hymen bleed and that is an infallible proof of virginity. If you, if you don't read it like that, but you do read it like this is about parents either defending their daughter from a malicious accusation or it's about parents saying our daughter has fundamentally subverted our authority and undermined the fabric of society and therefore we think she should die it it makes much more coherent sense because it is about the parents relationship with the daughter now i appreciate this answers one question about the hymen it opens up another question about parent child relationships you know is it a good thing Right. For, for parents to be willing to kill their own children. And um, and absolutely, no, it is not a good thing. Um, so I just I do appreciate that in answering one conundrum, I'm kind of opening up another conundrum that's a lot more complex. But it what the, the, the key takeaway is we can't exegete it in the context of sexual ethics. We have to exegete it in the context of parent-child relationships. Mm. And, um, and, and something else that Aaron Collar said is he's like, okay, so we've got this law about a daughter, about a delinquent or wayward daughter. There's another law in Deuteronomy 21 about the wayward and the stubborn and rebellious son and carries exactly the same penalty, you know, and, and, in, and, and, and so you're like, okay, so so actually, so in some ways, there was this kind of equality between sons and daughters. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't just daughters who could be killed by their parents. The 
um, you know, the, 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 the law about the stubborn and rebellious son um, has been, you know, debated and interpreted by the rabbis who are like, okay, well, is this right? Should we ever, you know, is there ever such a son, you know, should they ever die? You know, like when, you know, they were troubled by it. They didn't want parents to just go around killing their kids. You know, they were like, this would be really bad. And, and Jesus's parable of the prodigal son is very much an exegesis of that law. I mean, it's a very interesting one as well. So, so you, so suddenly, you know, this law that we thought in Deuteronomy 22, this law that we thought said all premarital sex for women is a capital offense. Suddenly it doesn't say that. It's like, suddenly it's like, you know, this was a law about parent-child relationships. And if we want to interpret it and exegete it, we also need to think about the power of the prodigal son. Mm. And it's like suddenly, suddenly the world is different. The world is very different. One, one last piece on this, the relationship between the law and what was practiced and what people believed in their values is complicated. Okay. So just because something is written in law doesn't mean that people necessarily carried it out. And something to remember about the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, is that you know a lot of people in that committed adultery um, none of them were executed for it, mm. which, which is interesting. So we, you know, just because it has something carries the death penalty doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that it actually happened. When we kind of we we grow up and we get taught to read the Bible, we want to believe, we want to take it at face value. We want to take that this this is what people did, and it, it yes, it does say something about what they believed. Yes, it does say something about what they what they did um but it is not necessarily the case that it was carried out and and um there's a one scholar alexander rofe who um very much holds the view that these laws written in the post deuteronomic period were um more idealistic than anything else they're, they're there to teach people morals they're not there to actually be carried out and and they are trying to stress the severity of the crime you know they're trying to say look you know parents you know children shouldn't be subverting parental authority they're, they're trying to do that there is an element of which you've got to realize that this is a genre this is not people actually did this um or people actually did this on a frequent basis um you know the the rabbis when they were interpreting it did did they were troubled by it and they did interpret it in ways that meant that actually the death penalty would never take place in practice so um yeah so we have to we have to be careful on that as well but yeah and most people <laughs> don't you know when they read the bible they don't have that context there of you know these were the laws but that's not necessarily um how they were practiced in in everyday life uh so it's super helpful to have that that context yeah. in that um, background knowledge. Um, so do you want to talk about, uh, I mean, you had kind of gone into like, this is not necessarily about virginity or sex before marriage. Um, you know, this is, this is about honor or slander. So do you want to talk about kind of what is the biggest misconception about these passages? Hello, beloved baddies. A quick break to tell you that this episode is sponsored by the Center for Art, Humor, and Soul a nonprofit that supports and amplifies the voices of edgewalkers through art that catalyzes change, laughter that brings us together, and soul awakening to the creative spark within us. The support from the Center for Art, Humor, and Soul has meant the world to this podcast, so I highly encourage you to check out their website, arthumorandsoul.com, to see their other featured artists and projects. If you want to support the podcast, you can check out our Patreon or get in touch. Now I'll let you get back to this episode of Called to be Bad. I think, actually, I'm going to take, I'm going to take the first question about, you know, about, about honor and then we'll, we'll get on to the misconceptions. So okay. I think, um, and, and this is, this is a very sensitive subject that, um, uh, you know, is very real for a lot of people and it affects a lot of women today um and, and we might we might not care so much um in in the west and um but it, it it's why because because the concept of family honor is so important to many cultures today this is one of the reasons why i want to study it and it is not 
I'm not studying it to kind of resurrect the idea and, and kind of normalize it so much, but to, but, but I think when we understand it and we frame the Old Testament in light of that, we get to discern what people were really trying to say. So there is, there is an assumption that if a woman does something that her parents don't want, then that can bring dishonor. Um, and there is also a sense in which if, if uh, an outsider man does something to a woman in the family, um, that also brings the family dishonor. And so these laws, they're, they're trying to regulate these threats to family honor. You know, when people take family honor too hard, too, too extreme, um, you know, really bad things happen um, and people lose their lives in a way that is, is really awful. And I think to a degree, these laws are trying to prevent that. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, there is still value that they, they, they still want to kind of recognize that you, you can cause offense and you shouldn't do that. So if you take um, verses 25 to 27, which is um, rape in the country, uh, where a, a man meets a betrothed virgin um, and he rapes her, it, it basically says five times in that text it, it, that she shouldn't be harmed. Five times. It, it, it says, you know, only the man who has done this could die. You know, she could have screamed, but there would have been nobody there to help her. You know, it, it kind of speaks up for her. And when I... When I was reading about this, and this is um, the work of Carolyn Pressler, who was analyzing this law. When I read this, I kind of thought someone's really, really trying to make a point here. And why would they feel the need to stress so much that no harm should come to her? So it, it is presuming her innocence and, and it's sticking up for her. And I, I just think it's really interesting. Um, I, I do wonder, is it possible that there would have been parents who like the second they heard that their daughter had been had lost her virginity in a way they didn't approve of would they think about killing her oh. you know and and if and if that's the case you know this law is like no do not do that and and if then you you go to the next one along the last law um which is about um rape maybe um with an unbetrothed virgin um, it, it says they should marry. Now, what's what's really interesting about that law is if you think about a Romeo and Juliet situation, mm. you know, Romeo has met, sorry, Juliet has met Romeo. Parents hate Romeo. Parents hate Romeo's family, but these two have fallen in love. They've had sex. <laughs> um, you know, what would the parents do if they found out? Now, in, in the play of Romeo and Juliet, you know, she's married Romeo. She's had sex with him. After that, her parents come to her and say, hey, we want you to marry Paris. Um, and she's like, oh, I'm, I'm not sure I want to marry Paris. And her father is like, well, fine, you can go out, you can beg, starve, die in the streets. I don't care, you know, how could you do this to me? You either marry him or I, I'll never see you again. And, and, and this, this is honor violence. This is, mm. you know, his sense of honor has, has you know, and, and his pride, his pride has been pricked. And he's angry with her. And so he's, he's so angry, so full of his own pride that he would glad, he would sooner see her dead than um, if, if, if she doesn't marry Paris. And, and, and at this point in the play, you know, he doesn't even know. He doesn't even know that she slept with Romeo. So you, you kind of think, what if he knew? You know, would he, would he think about killing her? Potentially. There, and and honour-based killings happen even today. Yeah. Um, but what's really interesting about this law is it's like, well, um, you don't you don't get to kill her. <laughs> they marry. And, and if and if a Romeo. So if that last law is in a Romeo and Juliet situation, what it's doing is it's curbing um, the, the the more violent expressions of honor violence. And, and what's also interesting when you compare it to other ancient Near Eastern laws about, about rape and um, the different circumstances when it was consensual or not, you know, if in, um, so there are these two laws, Mal A 55 and Mal A 56. If um, a man rapes an unbetrothed virgin, um, then they, they marry, which provides some kind of economic stability. But the father of the woman who, who was raped gets to rape the man's wife. Mm. And, and Deuteronomy has none of that. It's like, that is not going to happen. 
Um, and then, uh, but if it was consensual, then her father can do with her however he pleases. And you just think that is very creepy. <laughs> so I, I do not personally believe that for the last law, I think if there was a situation of rape, I don't believe any father who loved their daughter would require her to marry. I, I think they would recognize it as rape and, and they would refuse the marriage. And, and there's a precedent in Exodus 22 where it's like totally clear that parents can refuse the marriage. So I think if it was rape, it could be refused. I think the point is if it was consensual, um, it actually it protects her a huge amount, like as it would in a Romeo and Juliet situation. And I think that law, it, it's, a, it's a difficult law. I think it's designed for both situations. I think it's, it, it's trying to kind of carry that situation um, for, in, in both circumstances, but it, it's difficult for us because we're like, well, is it rape or is it not rape? And, and you know, and, it, and surely it can't be about rape because if she has to marry her rapist, that's really wrong. And I agree, having to marry a rapist is wrong. Mm. Um, I personally don't believe that's what the lawmaker was going for I think they were trying to disincentivize men so it's like well if you if you go sleeping around there are consequences to that so don't and also if um you know if these young lovers fall in love etc um parents don't get to go around killing people and they don't get to go around raping other women as as a vicarious punishment you know um so that that's the (laughs) That's the honest side of it. And, sure. um, and, and your other question was, you know, what are the biggest misconceptions about these laws? Probably the, the biggest misconception is not that we should apply them literally today. I don't know of any people who actually say that, which is good news. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I think there is a misconception that we already talked about, about the law as a genre, that people took them literally at the time. And I don't think that's, necessarily the case I think it's a mixture because they come from different times Mm -hmm. and they were written with different purposes um so yeah so one I don't think we should assume especially the ones in the middle with the death penalty knocking around when they didn't necessarily take them literally um two they were not necessarily written by the same person you know I I think the, the middle three where like the the woman is found guilty I think they were written later and kind of inserted into the middle of three other laws which are very much about women's um uh which are about women's well-being um and I I think and the third um misconception I would say is that um and this is this is probably why I really care about these laws is that um the misconception is that whoever wrote the law wrote only with the mindset of women as the property of men. Mm. And I genuinely don't believe that's the case. I, I, I have, you know, read through the scholarship about, you know, well, this is giving the father like authority over his daughter's sexuality and, you know, and, and there were different types of property and women were considered property, albeit not slaves. And I, I've, I've, I've read that. I read that. I think for myself, I, when you, when you compare this, these laws against the other ancient Near Eastern laws, and when you think about protecting the woman from all of violence, I, I just think whoever wrote this wasn't writing with like, you know, materialistic, like commodifying assumptions about women is like, you know, it is actually valuing her life. So I see it like a general theme. And I think I've heard this from um, other theologians that there's this general theme. So like, there's no questioning that uh, these Hebrew scripture laws were written in a patriarchal, patriarchal context. There's no questioning that. Uh, but in general, I, you know, the more you learn about the context and like you were saying, comparing them to other surrounding um, laws, that there is this general theme of, you know, maybe it's not um, uh, liberate, liberating for women, but it is often protective of women or other uh, kind of marginalized peoples in the in the culture. Um, would you say that 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 trend is is generally accurate? 
I would say for these laws, mm. I would say yes, these laws are trying to deal with freeborn women. The laws regarding foreign women, oh, freeborn Hebrew women, the laws regarding foreign women, the laws regarding slaves are different. Um, and no, they are, they do not make me feel comfortable. <laughs> um, but in the context of the time and like what were they, what limitations were they putting on the patriarch um, actually are quite considerable. So I try to think of it as what is the direction of travel? Mm. Um, you know, where were they coming from? What were they challenging? What were they trying to support? And even if they're trying to uphold things like the idea of family honor, you know, what other scriptures do we have that we need to hold them in tension with? So you, you have the honor your father and mother, but you also have Ezekiel saying, you know, parents can be imperfect and you don't follow them blindly. So there is tension within the Bible. And I think we have to lean into that. Whilst I, I loved discovering that these laws were not nearly as bad as I thought they were. <laughs> um, you know, I think there is also a challenge of they're also not the laws I want to live by, you know, right. and, and it's like I might take wisdom from them, but I don't want to try and pretend that. They loved, they loved women, really, because um, <laughs> like, it's, it's more complicated and the class element of it um, is really difficult. Um, what, what bothers me is the lack of curiosity that just says these were bad, these were old, forget them. Because ultimately, you know, the Bible is a story. Mm. It's a story of a people. It's a story of Jesus as a member of those people and, you know, and what he did. If we just turn around and say to people, well, that that piece of your story that you were so proud of is actually really horrible and we're going to forget about it. You know, ra I, I feel like that's something that stifles curiosity rather than like, okay, well, that piece of your, that piece of your history is very puzzling, a bit weird, a bit troubling, but also interesting in ways I hadn't appreciated, more complicated in ways that I hadn't appreciated. Even your people at the time were wrestling with it and debating it. Um, and kind of reinterpreting it. And when you kind of have that attitude, then there's there's greater curiosity, there's greater willingness to hold it. And then there's greater potential for discovery when you realize much later down the line that, oh yeah, the prodigal son makes a reference to Deuteronomy 22. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> yes, I love that. I love that call to curiosity within scripture, even Hebrew laws where it seems so archaic, how can it possibly um, relate to our context today? That, that, that invitation to see, to look at these passages and wonder if there's something more here, if there's wisdom to be learned um, and not kind of just throw them away. You know, why was this written? Why was this important to these people? How is it forming them? How is it shaping them? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. So let's talk about the different ways you think about this passage now as a result of all this research and work that you've done with it. What potential does it have for opening up a more constructive conversation on sex, sexuality, marriage, virginity, honor, all those things. All those things. Yeah. So I think um, one of my big takeaways from this is seeing that these laws are more complicated and more different than I first gave, gave them credit for. And, um, and I, I think there are lots of positives to be found in them. There are still lots of questions to be wrestled with, but they are in and of themselves, I, I think competing voices from different times, trying to stress different things, trying to negotiate around different difficulties and different human behaviors and different human attitudes. And so when you when you see them as this kind of complex web of different voices, even just, it's just six laws, it's just six laws, but even with that, you have all of this complexity. So I, I think when you have that recognition of the complexity, it gives you freedom to ask questions about the Bible and it gives you freedom to ask questions about our lives today and about our sexual ethics today as well and and I think they attached this this concept of family honor to women's virginity you know um and they did it to women's virginity not to men's but to women's um was that good mm. I don't think it was um but when you recognize that that's how they thought and you kind of recognize that there are ways of challenging that in the text you can also challenge well what are the things that we've attributed significance to and do we need to attribute that significance to them mm -hmm. um you know I mean I, I was all I was all hung up about my hymen did I really need to be hung up no no it's just <laughs> huh? 
you know? Um, I think my last thing would be, this is an area that excites me mm. and that I'm passionate about and that I enjoy talking about and I enjoy studying about. If it is an area that troubles other people mm. and, you know, their faith is in a place right now where they they kind of don't want to know and don't want to know about this. That's that's legitimate, and I, I don't want to in any way delegitimize that for other people. Um, you know, I when I read the Bible, I feel safe. You mm. know, a lot of other people don't actually have that, and maybe that's because I got brought up on all the gospel stories, so I had all the Old Testament stuff later down the line, and 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 maybe it's I I don't know why. I don't fully understand why, but. For me, I feel safe. I feel safe to explore it. And if that's not the case for other people, you want to kind of come to it later, that's fine. I'm not saying I have all the answers, but I, I have found that in studying these, I have discovered some really lovely things about what some of the things that Jesus said, some of the things that Paul wrote. Um, I'm enthusiastic about sharing them. And I'm also enthusiastic about um, stopping people from growing up with some of the misreadings yeah. that I had. Well, Christine and all of you viewers and listeners, um, if you are at a place in your faith journey where engaging the Bible feels like a safe thing to do, may you engage these passages with a renewed sense of energy and curiosity and excitement so that you can engage the complexity and see what wisdom there is to be gained from these passages. Um, and may you go out with that sense of energy and earnest excitement. Amen. Amen. That's all for this episode of Called to be Bad. Keep being your bad, beautiful selves, and I will see you next time.